Birding is the fastest growing recreational activity in the nation, and Georgia has many birding opportunities. On this episode, we'll visit the Southern Rivers Birding Trail, and we'll learn how some biologists are protecting one of Georgia's bird species, the Sandhill Crane. Can humans teach birds to migrate? We'll find out. Over Georgia's rolling hills of the Piedmont, across the broad coastal plains, through the Blackwater swamps and into the Red Hills, a trail follows Georgia's southern rivers. The Southern Rivers Birding Trail is a string of 30 birding sites that have been carefully selected to provide the bird watcher and wildlife lover a breadth of opportunity. The Southern Rivers Birding Trail is the second birding trail in Georgia. The first one, of course, was the Colonial Coast Birding Trail that went from the South Carolina line down to the Florida border. This is by far the biggest birding trail in terms of distance and numbers of sites on the trail. We've tried to arrange these sites in clusters and so that if you follow the map that we can provide you, you'll find that each area of the state is located in a cluster, which is roughly equivalent to one day's travel from site to site. So there are four clusters, and so really it takes four days of good hard birding if you want to visit all of the sites in four days. But this is something that all of these sites are so unique and they change with the seasons that really to really appreciate each individual site and visit these places at more than one time of the year. You're going to find that this is a great area for birding and it's been largely overlooked for too long a period of time. Forget four days. Sit back and we'll take you to all 30 glorious sites of the Southern Rivers Birding Trail. Starting with number one. The northernmost site of the Southern Rivers Birding Trail is West Point Dam on the Georgia-Alabama border. Large birds such as osprey or the great horned owl are easily spotted at this site. Blanton Creek Wildlife Management Area is also located on the Chattahoochee River. Various waterfowl can be seen along the river in the late summer and early fall. Although songbirds, killdeer, and quail may be seen at any time. Callaway Gardens is an award-winning 14,000-acre garden, resort, and preserve nestled in Pine Mountain, Georgia. Year-round programs provide guests with opportunities to explore the environment and learn more about the world around them, including birds. We've got all the things that you need, the four elements, food, water, shelter, and reproductive space. And with the plantings we've got here, both, both uh, native plants and cultivated plants, we've got lots of trees. Now, there's a lot of activity here in the garden. Uh, cedar waxwings, for instance, are all over the hollies. And if you look over and see all those red berries there, uh, if you look carefully, you'll see in the shrubbery lots of cedar waxwings. And it's wonderful to see them, their little bandit-like um, eye patch across their eyes. And they're really beautiful birds. Another bird you can often spy at Callaway Gardens is the Georgia State Bird the brown thrasher, beating out the red-bellied woodpecker and the purple martin. Big Laser Wildlife Management Area is located along the Flint River. Birders here will enjoy spotting a northern bobwhite in the colder months, or during the warmer months, a green heron. Fifth on our list of 30 is Cooper Creek Park, a 187-acre park owned and operated by the city of Columbus. The park offers access to the Chattahoochee River and a walking trail from which waterfowl can often be seen. Oxbow Meadows Environmental Learning Center is also located in Columbus, Georgia. Oxbow Meadows is a unique area as it was once a landfill. Described as a hardwood wetland, Oxbow Meadows is home to a variety of birds, from nesting waterfowl to tiny migratory songbirds such as the prothonotary warbler. Small birds, they reach just five inches in length, but they're bright yellow and not easily confused with other birds. South of Columbus along the Chattahoochee River is River Bend Park and the Eufaula National Wildlife Refuge. Eufaula National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1964 and is located on the upper reaches of Walter F. George Reservoir. It was created with the objective to provide habitat 
for migratory waterfowl and other birds, such as the bald eagle and the wood stork. Wood storks are the only storks in North America because their primary food items are fish, amphibians, and aquatic invertebrates. Wood storks are usually found near water. George T. Bagby State Park is also located on Walter F. George Reservoir. Visitors may look for birds on the lake or along the Three Mile Nature Trail. Nesting wading birds, such as the great blue heron, can be seen here, as well as nesting ospreys. These birds can reach 25 inches in height and have dark brown bodies with white heads, except for a brown stripe from the eye to the back of the head. Both the male and the female build their nest out of branches and sticks, sometimes using rope and other debris. The Meadow Lynx Golf Course is operated by George T. Bagby State Park. I think Meadow Lynx Golf Course is one of the most beautiful golf courses in the state of Georgia. And here, people can actually combine birding and golfing. And here, people can rent a golf cart and actually go out on the golf course and enjoy birding while other people are out there golfing. So that is a really unique experience. I think people are going to really enjoy that. The great egret is one of the birds that you can see from the comfortable vantage of your golf cart. Walter F. George Dam is a stunning spectacle. Just south of the dam where the Chattahoochee takes up its course, hundreds of birds of all kinds congregate. They find the low waters below the spillway to be easy pickings for fish trapped in shallow areas. Walter F. George Reservoir is one of the hidden jewels of the Southern Rivers Birding Trail. It's an area in the state that really hasn't been birded as much as some areas in the state. And here, for example, is perhaps the best place to see wintering bald eagles. In the winter, it's not unusual to find as many as eight, as eight bald eagles feeding below the dam at Lake Walter F. George. You go to the headquarters that they have there. They've got a great uh, place to watch birds. You can watch birds at feeders and in close by you can find osprey and great blue herons and other birds nesting there. And it's a great place in the winter to go to find things like common loons and different types of waterfowl like golden eyes. We have uh, the ospreys. We have the rookeries around the lake. We have cormorants, egrets, herons. We have a lot of the winter birds that come in. We have pelicans that visit the dam, brown and whites. We have gulls and terns. Then we have the migration of the birds through the fall and the winter um, in the spring using the passageway of the river, the forested areas, particularly along the river. Kolomoki Mounds Historic Park is an important archaeological site as well as a scenic recreational area. Bluebirds are a radiant bird to spy guarding their nesting boxes. Over the past 30 years, eastern bluebird numbers have declined, apparently due to cold winters and competition with starlings and house sparrows for nest cavities. But bluebird numbers are now increasing, most likely as a result of nest box campaigns and warmer winters. Albany Nursery Wildlife Management Area is located in the upper coastal plain in an area of the state known for its large quail plantations. Various species of hawks, including the red-tailed hawk, can be seen hunting for prey over the fields of this once agriculturally significant area. Chickasawhatchee Wildlife Management Area is one of the newer WMAs in Georgia. This cypress swamp is home to many birds, including the pileated woodpecker. The pileated woodpecker is a large bird, nearly 16 inches in height. Both male and female are mostly black with a red crest. Their diet includes insects, fruit, seeds, and sometimes tree sap. Radium Springs Tract is located just south of Albany, Georgia. Here, it is quite likely to spot a northern cardinal. Common in suburban and open woodlands, this species can be seen year-round and does not migrate for the winter. Georgia Veterans State Park is located on Lake Blackshear along the Flint River. Mockingbirds, most famed for their vocal imitations, are thrilling to watch here in the spring when they can be fiercely defensive, protecting their nests and territories. Wolf Creek Project is located in Turner County near Ashburn, Georgia. The Wolf Creek Project was initiated in 1997 to study the effects of habitat manipulation in an intensive farming system. 
quail are likely to seek refuge in the field borders, and dove can be seen over the open fields. Paradise Public Fishing Area may seem at first an unusual site for a birding trail, but with over 68 ponds, it's a paradise for birds, including the pied bill grebe, the colorful wood duck, and on this day, the yellow-rumped warbler. At Paradise Public Fishing Area, you'll uh, see several different habitats. Uh, we have lakes and ponds that are open to fishing. We also have 325 acres of pine plantation, and then we have other areas, upland areas, and in the, in the longleaf pine wire grass, we have a 1.3 mile nature trail that'll offer birders a good opportunity to go and walk the trail, uh, see both the wetland habitat and the longleaf pine wire grass habitat. The Paradise Public Fishing Area stands out as one of the best examples in the state of a place where people can go and enjoy some of the best fishing anywhere that they'll find. But also, it's a great place where you can go and enjoy primitive camping. Uh, there are bird watching opportunities, and you'll be able to hunt duck and dove there. We're very excited about Paradise Public Fishing Area being part of the Southern Rivers Birding Trail and I think it's going to offer a really good opportunity for birders to come out here and enjoy the lakes and enjoy the different scenery that's out here and that's available for them. Reed Bingham State Park surrounds a 375 acre lake and is less than six miles from Interstate 75, making this site a convenient stop on the Southern Rivers Birding Trail. Black and turkey vultures roost upstream from the lake and are the birds most often associated with this park. They can be commonly seen on the roadside eating carrion, but are most often seen riding wind currents and thermals. Grand Bay Wildlife Management Area, sometimes called the little brother of the Okefenokee Swamp, is the second largest natural blackwater wetland in the coastal plain of Georgia. For John Swiderski, former president of the Georgia Ornithological Society and his wife Kate, Grand Bay is a special place. We enjoy uh, Grand Bay, which is real close to us, probably about seven or eight miles. We try and go there at least once a month. It's a, a wonderful uh, so, pond cypress area with a quarter mile bird walk out to the tower, and it seems to be different every time we go. Of course, the real treat of the summer there are the prothonotary warblers that occur uh, in quite a few, quite large numbers in the summertime. Uh, it's also a good place for wood ducks and uh, alligators, you know, those things too. Stephen C. Foster State Park is the gateway to the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. And at 400,000 acres, the Okefenokee is a veritable wonderland for bird watchers. The long-necked and graceful anhinga is commonly seen here. The forbidding hoot of the barred owl is often heard here, which helps to explain why barred owls are sometimes called swamp owls. Fairchild Park is part of the recreation complex of Lake Seminole, a reservoir created by Jim Woodruff Dam. Nationally recognized as a premier spot for fishing, Lake Seminole has become increasingly noted for bird watching. Waterfowl such as mallards and Canada geese are likely to be seen, and it's not unusual to see a few turkeys strutting around. Pebble Hill Plantation is located just south of Thomasville, Georgia. Pebble Hill was originally a cotton plantation, first established in the early 1800s. Now Pebble Hill is on the National Register of Historic Houses and is open to the public. The peregrine falcon is one of the remarkable birds that can be observed here. And finally, our last site of the Southern Rivers Birding Trail, Birdsong Nature Center. Birdsong is located just one mile from the Florida border south of Thomasville, Georgia. It was once a working plantation and became a nature center in 1986 with a distinct goal in mind. The philosophy was that if you understand it and you know what it's about, you'll value it more and make it part of your everyday life. A lot of the um, instructional activity and nature experiences that go on here are for children, but moreover for teachers of children because one teacher can influence hundreds and hundreds of children. Birdsong's claim to fame is the fact that it has one of the most beautiful bird windows that you'll find any place. In fact, I think it's been written up in national publications indicating that it is the best birding window in the state of Georgia and perhaps the country. 
And by that I mean you can go in, you can leisurely sit in a chair and look out these beautiful big windows and see a host of different types of wildlife that come up to water and food that's been provided for them. Through this window you might see anything from a covey of quail come in to eat food, to cardinals, to you just about name it. Any of the type of birds that you might find in southwest Georgia would be seen through the bird song bird window. Uh, we're on the outside where the birds are. Usually the, the people are on the inside and the birds are free out here. We keep it dark in there and there's a large window so that as you're sitting around you can see just a, a number of species. But besides this window, there are the other 565 acres of land and there's a bluebird trail. There's a swamp area which attracts all kinds of waterfowl, lots of ducks, egrets, uh, cormorants, etc. The land has actually been managed to maximize the variety of flora and fauna that are native to this area. If you're looking for a real change in your usual routine, if you're looking for an atmosphere that can really influence a different way of seeing and feeling about the world, I highly recommend coming to Birdsong. Bring your lunch, bring some water, sit out anywhere on the property and, and meditate, just relax and, and just be a part of what is. And uh, that's one of the loveliest vacations I could recommend for anyone. Bird watching is one of the fastest growing recreational activities in the nation. The Colonial Coast Birding Trail provides unique opportunities for this environmentally friendly activity. Fort Morris State Historic Site sits on land that was originally a Gwale Indian village. The Savannah Ogeechee Canal Museum and Nature Center provides opportunities to see songbirds, wading birds, and other wildlife along the canal. Mellon Bluff Nature Preserve is privately owned and offers unique opportunities to view birds in salt marsh, woodland, and creek swamp habitats. Cumberland Island National Seashore is a largely undeveloped 36,000 acre barrier island. 322 species of birds have been seen there. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge is the largest national wildlife refuge in the eastern United States, containing habitat for more than 234 species of birds. Find information about all the sites along the Colonial Coast Birding Trail at georgiawildlife.com. Since the days of the earliest settlers, explorers and naturalists have extolled both the natural beauty and diverse habitats of Georgia. In fact, even today, in the face of widespread habitat destruction, the southeastern region of the United States is home to some of the most diverse plant and animal communities in the world. Though complete restoration is impossible, there is hope for saving what wild natural areas do remain. And when you preserve the habitat, you preserve space for the restoration of wildlife too. Wildlife like the highly endangered whooping crane. Only 400 whooping cranes remain in North America. Of those, only about 250 remain in the wild. There is one migrating flock of about 180 birds, but this single flock lives a precarious existence and could easily be wiped out by a single natural disaster or avian disease. As part of a collaborative international effort, the Whooping Crane Recovery Team will use an ultralight aircraft to teach a young flock of these rare birds the migration route from Wisconsin to Florida. The goal here is for this flock to become self-sustaining. With successful breeding seasons, they can become an integral part in helping to remove this magnificent bird from the endangered species list. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be to see a flock of whooping cranes migrating across Georgia's skies? Or to hear their ethereal call high above the Georgia landscape? It could happen, and in fact, Georgia would be one of only seven states they visit on their 1,250-mile migration from Wisconsin to Florida. We caught up with the recovery team as they tested their plan with Sandhill Crane. Co-founder of Operation Migration and one of the ultralight pilots is Joe Duff. The ultimate goal of this project is, is really to establish a second population, a migratory population of whooping cranes. If it works, uh, we'll be working at it uh, for five years. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll migrate with five separate generations. We hope by then there'd be enough of a core group that they, we can add birds to that core group and that will be the, the basis of it. The population of birds would be considered self-sustaining when there are 25 breeding pairs. So I expect that would take 15, maybe 20 years. A lot of species of birds learn the migration route from the previous generation. And if you're trying to re-establish a population or there's no previous generation, then they, they become resident. 
birds that have released become resident. So we've developed this technique where we use the ultralight to, to actually um, act as surrogate parent. Um, the birds are imprinted on the handlers, although they're costumed, and we say they're conditioned to follow the aircraft. We do that right from the start, right from uh, when the bird uh, pips. You know when the egg, uh, they punch a little hole in the egg, that's called pipping. And it usually takes a number of hours before it actually cuts the end of the egg off and hatches. That's when the chick would start to communicate with the parents, so we do the same thing. We play a recording of the aircraft engine, and we also play adult crane calls to that chick, so the chick knows that it is a sandhill crane. When we first started this study, we used uh, Canada geese because they were, they were plentiful and there's, you know, there's lots of them. They're not endangered and they're a very hardy bird. Uh, we always had it in mind to work with an endangered species and, and, and our, our species of choice is the whooping crane. That they're a bird that's in dire need of a new migration route. So uh, we can, of course, work with whooping cranes right off the bat and we use uh, sandhill cranes as a research surrogate. Sandhill cranes, as you know, are, are very plentiful and, and uh, they're not endangered and uh, they're a very similar species. So uh, we did uh, a, a number of preliminary studies to, uh, to uh, establish the protocol. Our main concern with these birds is, is uh, keeping them wild. That's, that's the most difficult part. We know that we can leave them south. We know we can make them winter at a specific area. We know they'll return on their own unaided in, in, in the spring. Um, the problem is, is keeping them wild. We started uh, you know, back in 1993 to do the first migration. It was our hope from that point to, uh, to use this uh, with an endangered species. And, and uh, you know, we uh, had to conduct a number of studies to answer questions that the, that the recovery team, the whooping crane recovery team had. Uh, we, uh, we did successfully answer those questions until they believed that it was a viable method of, of, uh, of reintroducing an endangered species uh, in a migratory situation. You can imagine, I mean, we're talking about leading birds across the country with an ultralight. It's a pretty harebrained idea, but when you start to think about it and work at it for a while, it's not so harebrained, and it does work. So, so to have a, a lot of agencies, uh, you know, get behind this and, and, and support it is, is, is a, it's a long way to, to have come. Working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as the public affairs officer is Chuck Underwood. About three years ago, the International Hooping Crane Recovery Team decided that we needed to do an additional migratory flock in the eastern U.S. We know from historical records there was a flock there at one time, uh, so they began looking around how can we do this uh, cost-effectively, at the same time be successful in doing it. Uh, so we began from a partnership with the International Crane pa Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin, uh, the Patuxent National Wildlife uh, Research Center in Maryland. Uh, with the USGS. We also began partnering with the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and all the flyway states in between Wisconsin and Florida to develop a, a partnership to begin reintroducing uh, the hooping crane to the recent U.S. So by partnering all these folks up, we're able to play off each other's strengths at the same time develop uh, funding for a project that wouldn't be available individually as a, uh, without, without the partnership. One of the biggest challenges of this project has been to keep these captive raised birds wild. That means strict protocols when it comes to human crane interaction. Operation Migration Biologist Dan Sprague explains. There's absolutely no talking around the birds. We try to limit how much human activities that uh, we do in front of the birds. For instance, when we're, when we're doing caretaking of the birds, we'll try to, to do most of it when they're away from the pen. We'll go in scrub out the, the water pans they have are look like a puddle in the ground they're very natural uh, we give them feed put down we may put down corn or feed or whatever when they're not there so they're not seeing somebody that was somewhat human form feeding them uh, there's absolutely no talking we only communicate with them with a digital recorder that's part of our protocol and we always use the puppet head to attract their attention down here so it looks more natural Dan joined the team to learn how to fly with Operation Migration and most importantly, to help the whooping crane. I grew up in one of those families where we did a lot of camping and fishing trips and my parents, uh, my grandparents taught me an appreciation for, for open space and wild things. And uh, even at a very young age, I, I had a profound interest in, in animals and outdoor activities. And uh, that's not something I could live without. There's nothing I would want to live without. The next morning, the planes took off, followed closely by the flock on the way south to Florida. They finished their month-long 1,250-mile flight 11 days later. The journey worked so well for these sandhill cranes that the spectacular hoopers may grace the skies over Georgia as early as next fall. I, I think the chances for the hooping crane survival is very good because uh, the wild population that migrates from northwestern territories of 
Canada down to the Gulf Coast of Texas has about 188 birds in it. It had less than 20 when we began restoration efforts. So uh, in the recent years, it's been growing about 4% a year. So uh, it looks pretty bright. What does it mean when an animal is listed as threatened or endangered? Threatened. A species that could become endangered, but whose population levels may ensure its survival without artificial assistance. Endangered. A species in danger of extinction, which, without artificial assistance, cannot maintain population levels to ensure the survival of the species.